good morning participants uh, welcome back so it's nice to find you uh, more than 55 uh, participants uh, who joined on time and uh, as we speak uh, a few more uh, will join definitely i hope uh, in next uh, five, 5 minutes uh, at the most most of them will join back so i welcome you once again uh, uh, mr padmanabhan so i'm stopping sharing and uh, i'm giving you sharing rights so just give me a couple of seconds so as, uh, he has told about apgas and uh, uh, he has also given us a brief uh, uh, sell, uh, diy kind of thing where you can also do many things uh, so i welcome uh, padmanabhan sir once again sir uh, do you see the share connection Yes, sir. It is visible. You can share my screen. Sir. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the day two of the training. So uh, let me open the topic. What we are going to cover today. I hope you are able to see my screen, sir. Yes, yes, I can. See. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah. So uh, let us understand the session topic. What we have to cover today. We started with the compile and uh, generate the yes, implemented design on the FPGA board. There are two methods I showed you. One is with the DE ten light board, where we use the traditional method. And with the D1 SOC board, I showed through Labs Land setup, where you can generate the SRAM object file in your local uh, system, and uh, you can upload that SRAM object file uh, after cre uh, creating the credentials with the Labs Land setup. So today our focus would be on timing analysis, applying the timing constraints and achieving the timing closure, IP catalog and IP design. Introduction to the platform designer. Introduction to Intel SOC FPGAs, and then we have a demo and a hands on lab on all these topics. So let us understand uh, the details 1 by 1, and then we'll go ahead with the uh, timing analysis 1st. And then we will understand how to apply timing constraints for the design. What we created yesterday or what we are going to develop today. And. Uh, we will later we will move on to introduction to IP catalog and uh, generation of the design system using the intellectual properties. And then we will have a brief introduction about the Intel SOC FPGAs and why do we call that as an SOC FPGA? And what are the different family variants that are present in Intel SOC FPGA and how do we work on a simple lab using that SOC FPGAs? Right. Let me uh, start the objectives uh, for the first session. We are going to understand the Quartex Prime timing analyzer, timing analysis design flow. Uh, so, before so Padmanabha, that... excuse me. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Uh, so, there was one query from one of the participants uh, that uh, they were trying to uh, do virtual lab practice on Labs Land. As a student, they wanted to register. But they were asking registration link. What do you mean by registration link there? It is there in the lab manual itself, sir. Yesterday, so I I can just uh, walk yes, you through yes. that. If you can show that, yes, sir, everybody sure. will get benefited. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yesterday, I hope I have shared that lab manual with you, sir. Yes, I have shared the the lab manual with everybody. All right. So then I can show that what is available there, so that they will get a clear picture. Correct. Correct. Uh, so, if we go through uh, the uh, material, what was shared yesterday. So, in the introduction to Quartus release, when you unzip this file, you will have the introduction to remote lab with this lab plan. After you complete the synthesis and the implementation process of the first design, hope you can remember that I have showed you switch to LED design, right? So, let me directly take you to that particular page. Uh, so, if you get in this particular place right where after creating the uh, synthesis and the implementation portion right so you can see this right so this is the place where you can see this is the link you can see click on this link 
and you will be instructed to create a student account. Enter your credentials. So in the lab manual itself, 4.6 programming your FPGA design using labs land remote board access. So, so this is page number 19. So in the lab manual, directly if you click this link, this will take to your page where you can create your own credentials. You can see create a student account. So you can create a student account. After you create a student account, you can using those credentials, you can enter into the labs land setup. And as I shown that once you enter into the labs land setup, it will ask you no ID. So the moment you say access, then it will take a minute time and then it will allocate a system for you where it will allocate an FPGA board for you, which is hosted in the University of Washington. You will have three minutes time to upload your SOF file and verify the functionality. So everything is available in the lab manual. So please refer to it and you will get uh, uh, how do we proceed with this in the uh, lab manual details. Itself. So here you can see all the details that are mentioned in the lab manual. Any specific doubts, sir, other than this? Uh, let us see uh, if, if you have shown this, uh, if any doubt comes, they will uh, ask, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank, so, you. Thank you, and sorry for the interjection. No, no problem, sir. So if they create this credential for the first time, like so they can use it for some time, they won't immediately remove their login, right? So uh, what I suggest is let them have some few designs uh, and then generate the SRAM object file. And they can go to the labs land setup and then they can experiment all the designs what they have instead of just doing one design today and then doing another one tomorrow. They can have some few designs which are ready so that they can have the complete digital logic design labs ready so that they can uh, put everything at one stretch so in those three hours. They can complete and check all the functionalities. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. All right. So, uh, what are the objectives for the 1st session? Let us understand that. We are going to understand the Qualtas Prime timing analyzer, timing analysis design flow. So before entering into the timing analysis design flow, we are going to get some details about what is the concept of timing analysis and what are the different uh, terminologies that need to be addressed during timing analysis. I am going to explain that to you. Then we will have uh, the basic idea of how to apply timing constraints. So apply basic and uh, complex timing constraints to an FPGA design. Analyze an FPGA design for timing using the Quartus Prime Timing Analyzer and write and manipulate SDC files for analysis and controlling the Quartus compilation. So we are going to understand how to write and manipulate SDC files, synopsis design constraints files for analysis and controlling the Qualtas compilation. So we are going to understand how do we achieve the timing closure right after getting all these details. Right. Let us uh, explore and see where we stop and uh, what is the continuation for the day. So we have to see uh, that we developed Verilog or a VHDL code yesterday. We performed analysis and elaboration. And uh, we developed a test bench and performed a functional simulation. And then we performed a synthesis and then implementation. Before we perform synthesis and implementation, we applied the physical constraints yesterday. So we applied the pin constraints by referring to the lab manual. In the first lab, what I did is like in the first lab demo, I opened the DE10 light lab manual. Uh, from there, we have seen. Uh, two switches and one LED. What is the pin number? Like pin C10, pin C11, and pin A8. All those things we apply by referring through the DE10 light user man. Whereas in the second lab, what we did is like we had a tickle script which has the pin details, so that we directly copy pasted it, and then we continued the program. But uh, the focus for today's session in the first portion would be on applying the timing constraints. So yesterday we applied only the physical constraints, the pin constraints. Today we are going to apply the timing constraints also and how to achieve the timing closure. That is also very important for the design. So yesterday's focus was uh, how to implement the design onto the board with additionally and how to implement the design onto the board using the labs land setup. But uh, today the first portion would be on the timing analysis and how to achieve timing closure before we enter into the 
system on chip design. Right. So to recollect, you can see what happens in the synthesis process and the fitter process was explained to you yesterday. Let us understand the fundamentals of timing analysis. Now, if you see here, uh, there are three types of paths. One is called as the clock path, other one is called as the data path, and then you also have the asynchronous path. Now, if you see here, there are two types of analysis we can do. One is called as the synchronous analysis, clock and data path, and then we all can also do the asynchronous. You can see there is an asynchronous path that is available. But at this junction, let us just go through only the clock path and the data path. You can see there is a clock path. That means it reaches the first flip flop and the same clock reaches the second flip flop like that. And you can also see the data path, which is T clock to Q plus T combo, and then it reaches the data pin of the second flip flop like that. We can see there is a launch flip flop, and then we also call this as a capture flip flop. So launch and capture. You can also call that as a source flip flop and a destination flip-flop or source flip-flop and a latch flip-flop like that. Right. So let us uh, go still further and understand how the timing analysis is performed by dividing the uh, paths, right, into by dividing the circuit into different number of paths. So now let us explore them in detail one by one. So when you say there is a timing path, there are important things like you can see that you can see there are uh, three data path types that are available one is you can see there is an input edge path it's a register to register path there is a register to output path so there are three parts now before getting into the details first we need to understand what are the start points and what are the end points in timing analysis so what is timing analysis first we'll understand right so timing analysis is an analysis like you are going to perform analysis, right? First one, and then we are going to perform debug, and then we are going to perform validation. So all the three. So we are going to perform analysis, debug, and validate the timing performance of a device. So how are we going to perform analysis, and how are we going to perform debug, and how are we going to validate? That's what we are going to see today. So to get into those details, we can see that what are the important start points and end points. So what are start points? Let us see that here. Start points are input ports, and then the clock pins, right? So this is the start. These are these two are the start points. And what are the end points? You can see that end points are the data pin of the flip flop, and then the output port. So remember, what are the start points? When you say the start points are input port, and then the clock pin and what are the end points when we say the data pin of the flip flop then the output port so based on these start points and the end point the circuit is divided into three important categories here so if we go through this now now input to reg you can see that input to reg path if you have a look it starts from an input port goes through the combinational logic and the end at the data pin of flip flop. Because what is the end point I told you? One is the data pin of the flip flop, the other one is the output port. Now you can see input to reg path. If you see what is the start point when you say input port, what is the end point when you say that is the data pin of the flip flop? So this is the first path, which is input to reg. Second path, what we need to discuss is called register to register path, which is called as from sequential element to sequential element. So we can see that it starts from the clock pin. This is one more start point. Goes through the combo logic and ends at the data pin of the flip flop. We call this as a register to register path, which is reg to reg. And the third one, what we are trying to see is called as from sequential element output. That means it is from the start point is a clock. You can see that where it is ending is the output port. You can see that. So this is a red output part. So you can see it starts from the clock pin and then it ends at output port. What are the three important timing parts you have? The first one is input to reg. 
So it starts from the input port and the ends at the data pin of the flip flop. And the second one is called as what? Reg to reg, it starts from the clock pin and the ends at the data pin of the flip flop. And the third one is register to output path, which starts from the clock pin and the ends at the output port. We call these as the timing path. So in static timing analysis, now what happens? Why it is called STA? Because in side dynamic analysis, what we are going to perform today, it does not require any test vectors. We are not going to worry about whether we are having zero or one, right? So we don't need to pass any test vectors. So static timing analysis is the method which we are going to follow in today's session. Okay. And we also have dynamic timing analysis, which is called timing simulation, which requires the test vectors. The advantage of tight timing analysis because it is faster because it is going to analyze the circuit by dividing them into timing paths and then find out which is the longest path. Right? What is the longest path? When you say you have the net delay, you also have the logic delay. When you add those delays, which path is having the longest path? That path is called as the critical path. So the fundamental goal of STA is to find out the critical paths in the design. So what is a critical path when you say a critical path is the path which takes the longest delay? That's what we are going to find out here. So which is the longest path which we will find out? If that path is meeting timing, then we don't need to worry about the rest of the paths. That's the way how we are going to analyze it today. Right, let us uh, explore further. In order to perform this timing analysis effectively, there are two important uh, analysis that we need to do. One is called as the setup analysis, and the other one is called as the hold analysis. So when we need to do setup and hold analysis, what we need to keep it in mind is that we will see. The setup and hold analysis, which we are going to do here, ensures that the clock and synchronous signals do not arrive at the register input or about at the same time. That means the clock and data are running in the race. We should ensure that okay, who should win because there is a setup time. That means we should ensure that the data should be ready before the clock. So we should ensure that uh, when they are running in the race, what should happen? So we ensure that the data, the clock enable, do not arrive at the register input or about at the same time. If they are coming at the same time, what will happen when you say the data becomes unstable? So that is called as metastability issue. So the register transfers data in a known or guaranteed behavior because we should know that when I transfer the data now in this cycle, when I should receive the data in the capture cycle, that means in the destination flip. So we should ensure that the design should not have any violation. Right? You can recollect yesterday when I was explaining about the hyperflux architecture that there were many registers that were present in the routing segment and that helps you to achieve timing performance, right? So today we can have a look at it. So that means we can see how the timing analysis engine performs the timing analysis in quarters prime design software that we can have a detailed discussion today. Right. Let us understand what is the setup time and what is the whole time? You may be aware of this definition, but then this helps you to find out the data arrival time and the clock arrival time, and then this helps you to compute the slack for us, right? So let us explore further so that we can get the clear picture of what happens inside the timing analysis. Now, when you see setup, the minimum time, the data signal must be stable before the clocking. So minimum time before the clocking event. The data is stable. The data must be stable. It's called as the setup time. You can see that before the clocking event, if the data is stable, then we call that as a setup. So minimum time before the clocking event, the data must be stable. That's what we are trying to check here. Then what is hold when you say the minimum time, the data signal must remain stable after the clocking. That means uh, minimum time after the clocking event, the data must be stable. It's called as the whole time. What we should ensure here is between the setup and the whole, we should ensure that the data is not changing. That is very, very important for us. So the data should not get changed right in this window, in the setup and the whole window. That's what is our validity. We have to ensure that 
the data should not change. That means when you see it is a process of analyzing, debugging, and validating the timing performance of your design. Right? So that means we should also validate that the data is not changing in this window. That is very, very important for us. Right? So now what we have understood so far, if we recollect, what are the different set of timing paths? That means the circuit is divided into different sets of timing paths. And on what basis they are divided into different sets of timing paths? If we see there is a start point and the end point. So what are start points? And what are the end points we could recollect right now? So start points are input ports and the clock pins. And what are the end points when you say they are data pin of the flip flop and then the output port? So then what we have got into is what is the definition of setup and what is the definition of port? Let us explore further. Right. So as I explained earlier, you can call the first flip flop as the launch flip flop. And the second flip flop has the capture flip. So we can call this as launch, capture, source, destination. Like that we can call. Right now, what is launch edge? We can see the edge which launches the data from the source register. So you can see this is the launch. And what is the capture when you say the edge which latches the data at the destination register? So you can see this is called as the latch edge or the destination. Now, between the launch and the capture, what is the meaning? It is a typically one clock cycle rising to erase. This is the way how we are going to compute. So now the timing analyzer will assume that within one clock cycle, what is the data launched that should be captured by the capture flip? So we call this as typically one clock cycle, where we call this as rising to rising. So now we know what is launch edge, and we also understood what is a capture edge. That means uh, launch flip flop as well as the capturing flip flop, which is a destination. Let us explore further. There are two more important definitions which we should know to get into the details. One is called as the data arrival time, which is called as DAT, and the other one is called as a clock arrival time that we should know. So when you know what is data arrival time and what is clock arrival time, it is easy for us to get into the step of calculating the slack. Right, what is data arrival time? Let us explore that here. Time or data to arrive at destination registers in the input is called as data arrival time. In short, you can call this as EAT. You can just say EAT at this tension, like arrival time. Okay, what is this arrival time? You can see that. Just check only the data path. Don't see the clock path here. Just check only the data path because we are discussing only about the data arrival time here. So this is the clock one, right? So this is the delay, right? What is the time taken for the clock to reach the D pin of the flip flop, right? So the clock pin of the flip flop. And then you can also see there is a T clock, which is called as TCU, which is a transition delay. And then you have there is a combo logic, which is the T data. And then it reaches the data pin of the second flip flop. Now, how do you calculate this data arrival time? When you say data arrival time is equal to launch edge, and it is launched as T clock one. So this is the delay, right? The time taken for the clock to reach its clock input. TCO, which is the transition delay, T clock to Q, plus the T data from this portion, right, till it reaches the data pin of the flip flop, which is the combo delay. So that we are trying to take off. the net delay, the logic delay, everything we try to add it. Now, data arrival time is equal to launch edge plus T clock one plus TCO plus T data. Right. So this is on the data part. Similarly, we have to calculate and find out for the clock part. The second one what we need to discuss is called as the clock arrival time, which is called as CAT. What is this clock arrival time when you say the time for the clock 
to arrive at destination registers clock input. You can see that when we consider the data path, we were considering this part, right? Now we are considering the clock path. You can see that the time taken for the clock to reach the first flip flop and the time taken for the same clock to reach the second flip flop is should be that. When we have a look at this here, we all knew that there would be a delay, right? Because the first flip flop may get clock earlier and the second flip flop may get clock later due to this, right? You can see this this net delay is there. We call this as a clock skew. So clock skew is a measure of difference in arrival of the clocks between successive registers. So between successive registers, if you see, you can see the first flip flop gets the clock earlier, and the second flip flop gets the clock later. So how much late that we can find out. So what is the time taken for the clock to reach the destination register? So destination register minus source register time, if you calculate, we will find out what is the clock skew. So now the clock arrival time is equal to latch here. Clock two. This is the clock. Two. The time taken for the clock to reach the second flip flop. Now we have arrived at two important definitions. One is the data arrival time, which is DAT. And the other one is the clock arrival time, which is CAT. You know? So you can say data arrival time. You can just in short, you can take it as arrival time AT. And then you can also call that as required time, right? So like that we can specifically do. So one is the data arrival time, other one is the clock arrival time. So let us explore further better. If there is a required, if there is an arrival type, there is a concept of required type. So when we are supposed to get the data, we need to understand that expectations also. Now, let us understand what is the data required. So we have discussed about arrival time of the data and clock. Now let us explore about the data required time. Which on the, this is done for both analysis. As I mentioned, we should do for setup and we should do for Hold for both analysis. Okay, what is the data required time? In short, you can call this as RT. The minimum time required for the data be valid before the latch edge. So the data can be successfully latched into the destination register. Now, if you see the data required time, which is set is equal to clock arrival time minus. TSU. That means uh, we have to ensure that the data should be ready before the clock arrival. Before means subtraction. Right? So minus TSU minus setup uncertainty. If there is any uncertainty that we need to ignore it. Like for example, you have a jitter. Right? So there may be a frequency variation in the clock source. So all those things are called as uncertainty. So we should ensure that there is no uncertainty available. So that need to be subtracted. So now if you go through this, how do we easily remember is when you have the data required time and we are performing this for the setup analysis for setup analysis setup time should be subtracted so remember when we are doing setup analysis we have to subtract the setup time because in the definition you can see minimum time before the clocking it that means you should have a subtraction when we are trying to do hold analysis Minimum time after the clocking. Therefore, for performing hold analysis, hold time should be added. So remember like that. Okay? So if you see here, data required time setup is equal to clock arrival time minus CSU minus setup uncertainty. So this is called RT. This is the required time for the setup analysis. Okay, now let us understand the hold. So as I mentioned earlier. When we are performing the hold analysis, the hold time need to be added. So now you can see that data required time hold is equal to clock arrival time plus hold plus th and then plus hold uncertainty. The easiest way to remember is in the setup analysis, you have to subtract setup time and the setup uncertainty. When we are performing the hold analysis, we have to 
add the whole time and add the fold answer. So if we could do this, then we can easily analyze the design with the timing performance. Now, what are the four things we have in our mind, mind right now? What is the data arrival time? And then the clock arrival time. And then data required time for setup and data required time for fold. Now, what we are going to calculate is called as slack, okay, which is the required time minus arrival time for the setup analysis. How do we do that? Let us understand that right now. This slide is very important for you to understand that, okay, what happens inside the timing analysis. When we do setup slack, how do we easily remember is it is required time minus arrival time. So it is RT minus AT. So required time minus arrival time should be a positive number. If that is a positive number, then the timing requirement is met. But if it is a negative number, then timing requirement not met. What we need to understand is in the setup slack, if the required time minus arrival time is a positive number rt minus at is a positive number then we can say the timing requirement is met but then if that is a negative number then we can say timing requirement not met. so just keep the formula as it is like it is rt minus at if rt minus at is a positive number then we can say the timing requirements whatever we provided it is met if that is a negative number whatever we provided is not meeting the time so then that is a problem. Okay, like uh, how are we going to solve that issue that we will discuss later. At this junction, we are understanding whether it is a requirement is met or not. Okay, what are the other factors that need to be kept in mind to perform timing analysis if we see? Number one is called as process, which is the manufacturing process, and then the operating voltage, and then the temperature. So we call this as a PET, process, voltage, and temperature variation. So this also we should keep that in mind. Right now, we have one formula in mind right now. The setup slack is equal to required time RT minus arrival time AT. So let us find the hold slack right now. It is reverse of the setup slack. So the hold slack is equal to arrival time minus required. It is AT minus RT. So the setup slack is required time minus arrival time. And the hold slack is arrival time minus required. So when the arrival time minus required time is a positive number, then we can say timing requirement is met. If that is a negative number, then we can say the timing requirement is not met. That is exactly the same case like what we discussed in the earlier uh, logic with setup. But only thing is the formula we should be very careful because one is done for the worst case, another one is done for the best case. So we have to see when it is a setup slack, it is required time minus arrival time. Whereas when it is a hold slack, it is arrival time minus required. How do we put everything in one slide and understand when you say? So that's what I'm going to bring that in the next slide. So we can have a note of this. This will definitely help you to perform timing analysis better. So how do we easily remember all these formulas right now? Slack is equal to minimum something minus maximum something like that you keep it minimum minus maximum if you know one then we can do the other we can easily find the other how do we easily do that see here minimum drt which is called as data required time in short you can call that as rt minus maximum dat which is like data arrival time so now if you write reverse then automatically you can get the whole example in this max you directly write here minimum and wherever you have minimum on the opposite side you write max then what will happen you will get both formulas so easiest way is you remember setup and you can easily derive the so you can see minimum drt minus maximum dat will provide the setup analysis here then the opposite of this, where minimum DRT is there, you write on the opposite side maximum DRT. And on the maximum DAT, on this side, you write minimum DAT. So 
So easiest way to remember is RT minus AT is setup analysis. AT minus RT will provide you the hold. Arrival time minus recruitment. Now this slide is very important for you to perform the timing analysis and then understand what happens inside the timing analysis engine. Okay, so setup is equal to minimum DRT, which is a data required time minus max DAT, which is the data arrival time. And for hold, it is minimum DAT, which is the data arrival time minus max DRT, which is the data required time. All right, so with this understanding, let us try to solve some problems, right? And then we will enter into the timing analysis engine. Let us take this example here. You can see there is a launch flip flop and then there is a capsule flip flop. You can also see there are two different sets of delays because we are going to perform both mean analysis as well as max analysis. So here you could see T min, T max, T min, T max it is provided for all the cases. You can see the net delay. You can also see the logic delay. Both are available here. This is very, very important for you to understand because once we get a hold of this, we can easily understand what happens inside the timing analysis engine. Now, let us explore the formula here and see how the tool calculates the delay. Now, setup slack is equal to minimum delay along the clock path minus maximum delay along the data path. That's what we should remember. So, minimum delay along the clock path. Means it is required time minus arrival time. Arrival time means data. Remember like that. So that is minimum data required time minus maximum data arrival time. We are going to subtract that and then see whether it is a positive number or not. Let us find that one by one. First, let us take the clock path for 20. That is the clock value which is expected to work at 50 megahertz. 20. You can see it is minimum. Minimum delay along the clock path means take the minimum number. This two plus five. Okay. Again, minimum value. Okay. Now, what you should understand is when you are performing the setup analysis, setup time should be subtracted. Right on the requirement side. Because we want the data to be ready before the setup. So minimum time before the clocking event, the data should be ready. So subtract the setup. So 20 plus 2 plus 5 plus 2 minus 4 minus maximum delay along the data path. Now when you go through the maximum delay along the data path, so there are two different values provided. Please take the maximum value, 2 nanoseconds plus 11 nanoseconds. This is the clock. Okay, this is the tick lock picking of this flip lock. Two nanoseconds plus 11 nanoseconds plus two nanoseconds plus nine nanoseconds plus two nanoseconds. So add everything now. So 20 plus two plus five plus two minus four. When you say it gives you 25. And two plus one plus two plus nine plus two gives you 26. So 25. Minus 26, when you see, it gives you minus 1. That means there is a setup violation. The design is not meeting the timing requirement, what we provided. That means we expected the design to work at 50 megahertz, but the design is not expected to work at 50 megahertz because there is a violation. Okay, right. Now let us explore how we can solve this problem. How we can solve this problem manually means what will you do? You will increase the period so that we will ensure that okay, it is giving zero, right? That is not the case when we do that with timing analysis, right? When we do a paper and pencil work, whatever number we want, we can modify. That won't be the case when we do timing analysis. That's what we should understand the timing concept very clearly so that we will have multiple methods to achieve the timing closure. Okay, now to simplify the task, what we can do here, setup flag is giving minus one nanosecond. How do we get zero when you say generally what we will do in mathematics is like left hand side LHS is equal to ROHS, right? Any mathematical problem when you say 
when there is a proof that are show that then we will be very very happy because somehow we will ensure that left hand side will multiply right hand side will multiply and somehow we will say that they are proved right so any other problem would be tough for example for example we need to do fourier series like we need to find out a not a and b and, and then we should put that in a big equation then we will be having issues because we need to find something but when there is a proof that are show that then we will be very very happy Right, because somehow we will ensure that the left hand side and right hand side are having the same values. So here also we can try something like that. So what is happening here? If you see, somehow I should get zero or a positive number. What we can do is if you increase the period to 21 instead of 20, what will happen is so this would be increased so that we are expecting the design to work at 50 megahertz, but that may not be the case because we are increasing the period to 21. Then the design is expected to work to only 47.6 megahertz. So now what we can tell to the customer is we expected, but then the design is not meeting timing at uh, 50 megahertz, but it can operate at 47.6 megahertz because it is providing a uh, setup violation when we try to operate at 50 megahertz, we can say. Right. Is there any other way? There are multiple ways, but then here how you can solve the problem in the paper and pencil work. Okay, because I am just giving some number. It is not working. I can increase it. You can. Right now, what is happening on the hold side that also we should. Understand because that analysis is also very, very important for us to solve the issue. Let us explore that right now. When we go through the hold analysis here. What is very important for us is to ensure it is arrival time minus required time. It is AT minus RT. So it is reverse. What we should do is minimum delay along the data path minus maximum delay along the clock path. In the earlier case, we took the minimum delay along the clock path and the maximum delay along the data path and subtracted. But now in this case, what we should do is minimum delay along the data path minus maximum delay along the clock path we should take and perform the timing analysis let us explore that now if we get the data here let us go through the data path this is one plus nine that's the minimum value plus one plus six this is the minimum value plus one now when you subtract get the maximum delay along the clock path, you can see Three nanoseconds, plus nine nanoseconds, plus three nanoseconds. You have to ensure that hold time should be added. You can see two nanoseconds that is added. Eighteen minus seventeen. It is showing one nanosecond. That means by increasing the clock period or by reducing the clock period, there is no impact on the hold analysis because we are not bringing the clock value inside the hold analysis. So there is nothing to do with the uh, clock period for the hold analysis. But then, what is very important here when you say the same design is having a setup violation, but it is not having a hold violation. So, what is this really logic here when you say your design should not have setup violation as well as hold violation? Your design should not have any violation. If there is any setup violation, also it is a problem. If there is any hold violation, also it is a problem. So your design should not have any setup or hold violations. Right now, what is the basic objective here? We will have a design. We need to identify the required time and arrival time. That means you can do a paper and pencil work and note down the values, and then we can check whether it is having a positive value or it is a negative value, whether the design is meeting the timing or not meeting the timing. Okay, let us explore one more simple example here. In the earlier case, we have multiple data that are available, but here we have taken a simple data just to see what happens inside the design. We wanted to check whether the design is working at 100 megahertz, that is uh, 10 nanoseconds. Let us see how it is uh, performed, right? So you can see minimum DRT minus maximum DAT is there. So now you can take that plus one right and then plus one that is the data required time that is the clock path minus two which is the setup so minus what we can do now take the data path here 
which is the one nanosecond, and then two nanosecond, and then five nanosecond, which is your TPD, or the propagation delay of the cohomology. So now, if you subtract, you are getting two nanoseconds. That means uh, your design is expected to work at ten megahertz. That means uh, ten nanoseconds, which is hundred megahertz. Now let us find out what happens in the hold slab. Write the formula reverse. Wherever you have max, write min. Wherever we have min, write max on the opposite side. So that we can identify what happens here. So when it is a minimum data arrival time, so it means take the minimum value here. Since they have provided the same value, we can take that opposite. So one plus two. Here minimum value they have provided. So three you can take minus we can see on the data required time set. that means on the clock side so one plus one and you have to add the whole time here we subtracted the set to 10 and here we have to add the whole time. now what happens is your set of slack is two nanoseconds and your hold slack is 2.5 nanoseconds earlier if we Analyze. There was a problem with the setup analysis. There was a negative number in the setup analysis, whereas the hold was having a positive number. But then in this specific design, if you see, there is no setup violation and there is no hold violation if the design is expected to work at 100 megahertz. But now I don't want that. I wanted my design to work at different frequency. For example, I want to ensure that the design works at 150 megahertz or 200 megahertz. What will happen in the same design? Let us explore that here. Instead of uh, 10 nanoseconds, if we use 6.6 .6 nanoseconds here, that means we are expecting the design to work at a higher frequency. Then what happens? Let us identify here. 6.6. .6 1 plus 1 minus 2 because we are expecting the setup minus 1 right which is your data arrival time 1 plus 2 which is your maximum number 5 this is the maximum if you see here minus 1 point but then when we see the hold it is same whether you add the clock and subtract there is no change in the hold analysis. So what you can understand from this discussion is there is no change in the hold analysis. In the earlier case also, the hold slack was 2.5 nanoseconds. In this case also, you can see the hold is having the same number. It doesn't change. So from this, what we have understood is by changing the clock period, by increasing or decreasing, there is no way we will have issue with the hold analysis. But then by modifying the clock, it will directly affect the setup analysis. So therefore, we have to be very, very careful. When you are applying a timing constraint, we have to be very careful because the applying timing constraints, right, will affect your performance. You have to be very, very careful. So when you apply the proper timing constraints, then that we don't have any problem. If you are applying the constraints in such a way they are under constrained or they are over constrained, then definitely we'll have issues with the design. So, so this is what is very, very important for us to understand. So till all this uh, thing, like what we have discussed when you see, we have just gone through the conceptual understanding of the timing analysis, the terms which are associated with timing analysis we have seen. Now we have to check how these uh, timing constraints uh, can be applied to the timing analyzer engine. Okay. Let us explore that right now. So <coughs> till this, the concept remains the same, but then when it enters into the tool, then every tool will try to do timing analysis differently, but then they are going to find out what is required time and arrival time, right? So the similar slack formula, we are going to check it. Let us understand what is a timing analyzer. So how are we going to do that in Qualtrics Prime Design software? 
let us explore that here. You have a timing analyzer where we need to apply the constraints. Where you can specify the constraints and then we can give the reports. So after applying the timing constraints, we are going to view the reports. That's what we are going to do. Right, so first thing is we should apply the specific uh, timing constraints which are required. And the second one is we need to view the reports. How that could be possible, let us uh, find out. Right, and then we will get into the details. Okay, introducing two timing analyzer flows. One is using the tool itself. And the second one is timing analyzer integration into the Intel Quartus Prime design software flow. So there are two timing analyzer flow. One is you are going to use the tool directly. And then we open the timing analyzer and then check the output. The second one is the timing analyzer integration into the Intel Quartus Prime design software tool flow. So that we are going to see right now. Both are helpful for us to do that. Okay. Now, first we generate the timing netlist. And then we can enter the SDC constraints, which is called as the synopsis design constraints, where we are going to create or read in the SDC file. So I'm going to show that and I'm going to also tell you how to create it. You can also parallelly do along with me and generate the timing constraints. And we can update the timing netlist after that. And we can generate the timing reports. And at the end of the day, you wanted to save the timing constraints, you can save it. If you don't want it, it's optional. So, for example, you wanted to analyze it, you analyzed it, and then you feel that, okay, the design is beating timing. You wanted to write that into an STC file, yes, you can write it. But if you feel that it is not required, then you can directly close it and come back. So that there won't be any updation in your SDC file and you can create, you can update your SDC file later. Okay. Right, this is the flow one. And what is the flow two? When we say, what is the difference when you see it here? We take a design where we need to perform synthesis. Then we are going to use timing analyzer to specify timing requirements. We configure timing analyzer in the Quartus Prime project. That means uh, we will use the timing analyzer and then we will specify timing constraints. Then we will configure timing analyzer in the Quartus Prime project and then we will perform full compilation and then we will verify whether the design is meeting timing or not. So all these things we, are, we can do. So we will try this method. How? We can apply timing constraints. That is very, very important for us. Okay, after applying timing constraints, what are the things which we can do? Like what kind of reports that would be generated by the timing engine? And how are we going to verify those uh, timing reports and check whether the design is meeting timing or not? Are there any violations? All those things we could completely check. Right. Now, how it will look like we can see that after performing the entire compilation, you can see that we need to perform the timing analysis also. This is very, very important for us to perform the timing. Once we perform timing analysis, the tool will provide you which is the longest path. That means you can understand that which path is taking the longest delay that we can find out. And we can also find out what is the expected, that is Fmax, what is the operating frequency of the design. So that also you could see from the timing engine. Right. So there are two commands and then there are two important uh, slides which I need to explain to you before we enter into the demo. One is after applying the timing constraints, we should definitely refer to timing reports. So for that, we use a timing called report timing. Okay, now where and how we can approach those reports? Let us explore that here. One is we can create reports after the synthesis, that means post map netlist, that is after synthesis process. Before you perform placement and routing, we can check whether the design is meeting timing or not. You can you can ask me why it is required because when the design is not meeting timing at the synthesis stage itself, there are violations in setup and hold at the synthesis stage itself. 
there is no point in performing the filter, which is placement and routing operation, because even after performing placement and routing, there are chances that the design may not meet it. At the synthesis stage itself, it is very easy for us to find out why the design is not meeting time. For example, between two flip-flops, if there are more number of logic levels, if there are 14 logic levels between two flip-flops, then before the data reaches the second flip-flop, the clock will reach. That means we have to ensure that uh, the design takes more than one clock cycle to propagate the data from one flip-flop to another flip-flop because it's a slow cycle path. We can easily analyze from our synthesis uh, logic or we can directly go back to the RTL code and find out why that particular path is providing a timing error. So all those things are possible at the synthesis stage itself. So when we are able to find the bug and fix it at the synthesis stage itself, then it is easy for us to go to the fitter operation. So after performing fitter and then the design is not fitting timing, it is time consuming because the fitter operation itself will take a lot of time for you after running for eight or nine hours. And then finally, if the design shows there is a timing violation, it is very tedious for, for us to fix it. Okay. So there are two important things. One is the post map netlist. The other one is the post fit netlist. Both it and fit. Post fit netlist means where you have already performed the placement and route. In both places, we can check whether the design is making timing or not. Okay. Right. Okay. When I get the report, what we can see from that? So when you say we can find out which is the worst case, like what is the value, whether it is a negative slack. Or whether it is a positive slack. When it is a negative slack, it also mentions you the total negative slack, which is called a TNS. That means it is the addition of all negative slack numbers. So we have to add all the negative numbers, and finally we will get a total, right? That is called as the total negative slack. Okay, this is the logic where how we can approach the timing reports. First portion, what we checked is we have to apply the timing constraints. Second thing is after applying the timing constraints, how do we approach and provide the reports? Like we can analyze the reports. So it is a process of analyzing, debugging, and validating. After applying the timing constraint, we have to analyze whether the design is having any violations or not. Okay, what is another important thing which we need to do? I will explain that. One is we can directly use the GUI. Or we can also apply the timing constraints using the tickle window, like tickle shell. Yesterday, when we were applying the physical constraints, you can recollect that for the second example, we copy pasted all the commands, like all the pin constraints, and pasted that in the tickle console. So that in one minute, within a minute, you could see that all placements are done. Similarly, it is possible for us to directly apply the command in the tickle console. Okay, what is the problem when you say when you are not very familiar with the syntax? Right, it is very, very tough for us to directly type the command because we have to ensure that the corresponding syntax is right or not. Because we should know the option, we should know the arguments, you should know the syntax, everything perfectly directly when you feed into the tickle. Okay, what is the another alternative way, easiest way for you? Is the GUI. You can use the GUI because that helps you to see the report immediately. Okay, what is the advantage of Tickle script then when you say the Tickle script will help you where we wanted to repeat that again and again so that you can have one script so that you can run that multiple times. It is very easy for us uh, to do repeatability. So, what is the suggestion here when you say first we are going to do that with GUI? And understand how the tool generates the command. And we can copy those tickle commands and paste that for future purpose, like that you can. That is the recommended method. First, we can get everything in GUI, get a hands on. Then we can also uh, generate the commands, uh, the tickle commands, which is coming from the GUI. We can copy paste them and create a tickle script, and then we can use it for repeatability. Right, so let us explore the first command for you to see what happens, right? Let me walk you through that. The first command, what we say 
it's called as the creating a base as a virtual clock. We call that as a create clock, which is called as create underscore clock. If you see the options here, the client name is create clock. And the option name you can see here, it shows name of clock and then the period. And then it shows waveform, whether it is rise and fall. And then we should provide the target. So the command what we are going to it is called as the create clock. Okay, let us explore that how we can apply that, and you can also parallelly do with me and see whether that works out well for us. Okay. I'll just stop here and then we will uh, jump the uh, demo. You can start design uh, parallelly with me. We will create a Verilog design. We will compile the code and then we will apply timing constraints and see what happens into the device. So you can click new project wizard. Say next. And in the C drive, you can create a project named timing analysis. Or okay, timing analysis is sufficient. A timing analysis you can. What is the name of the project? So the name of the project, you can just say continue. Okay, so let us take a simple example where you are going to generate the clock. So what is the name of the project? It's called. And what is the working directory when you say it is the C timing analysis I have provided. So it is a new project. So you can create it. Say next. It shows that the timing analysis does not exist. Do you want to create it? You say yes. And go ahead with the empty project because we are going to create it from scratch. Add files not required because we are going to create file. In the family device and the board setting, uh, please go ahead with the max 10. I will tell you what to You can really do that along with me. Max 10. Here you can say in the name filter 10 M 50. D A F four eight four C seven three. Okay, so select max ten from fifty, which is a fifty K logic element. D A F four eight four C seven three. All right. Now select the device here. I mentioned earlier it has 50k logic elements and you can see the total number of IOs, GPIOs, memory bits, the embedded multiplier. These things are useful for your digital signal processing. Right. So now we have applied this. So say next. VDA tool settings. We don't need to set anything here. Say next. Right. And then say summary. Now go to file, say new, say very log HDL file, and then save. So you can say module and say counter. Okay, input clock comma reset. Then you can say output. Reg three down to zero and say Q. So we can see that we are going to write a four bit counter. Input clock reset and output reg three down to zero Q I have provided. So now we can develop the always block here, always at pass it of four clock. Okay, comma negative of reset. You wanted to write asynchronous, yes, you can. Otherwise, you can write it inside the always. So always at passage of clock, comma negative of reset. Begin and then we can say if reset is equal to zero, then we can say else two is equal to q plus one. Say end. Let us take a simple example here. So you can see always at set of clock, one edge of reset. Begin if reset q is equal to zero. 
else q equal to q plus 1 is optimal. So it's an optimal term. So you need to save this design, so you save file and say save as and say count dot your product template. So I can just wait for a minute if someone is uh, typing it or following, please uh, do that. Uh, the idea is like we have talk reset. We have a four bit uh, counter output range three down to zero. So I have provided the left hand side of a procedure and assignment treatment to always be of type range. Okay. Right now, what we can do is like we can perform analysis and elaboration first. So let me first do that. Okay, now we can see that uh, it shows 100 percentage. Now we can go to pools and then we can go to the netlist viewers and then you can go to the RTL view. So you can see that there is an incrementer and then there is a flip flop, which you can see that it down to zero. That means there are four flip flops. Right now, what we can do is like we can perform full compilation and see whether the design is meeting timing or not, because we didn't apply any timing constraints, right? What happens in the report? First, we will understand that. Okay, let us continue the full compilation now. So it will take less than two minutes for us to perform the full compilation. Uh, we can see uh, the RTL schematic. Then we can see the technology schematic, which works with the Synthesized logic as well as the placement and routing. Okay, All right. Now, first I will remove the tick console so that that should not get confused. And now if you see, it shows how many number of logic elements are there and how many registers are there because you can see it is a, a bit uh, counter. So there are four flip flops. Now you can see the registers it is showing. And then you can see the total number of pins, memory bits, everything. So they does not require any memory bits, right? So everything is zero. Now let us explore the netlist viewer related to the technology map viewer, which is supposed to mapping. So just click that. When we see that you can able to see there are four flip flops here. You can see that register zero, that means Q zero, Q one, Q two, Q three. All the flip flops you could see, and along with that you can also see there is a combo logic between the flip flops. There is a register. What are we going to constrain first? When you say we are going to constrain a register to register path, so Q zero to Q one, then Q one to Q two. Then you can see Q2 to Q3. Like there are different register to register paths here. Now, what happens after uh, the complete placement? That means you have the post fitting. Okay, so if you see the technology map, we were post fitting. You can see there are four flip flops here. So one, two, three, and then four flip flops are there. All right. Now, what is important for us to understand is it has shown everything in black. Right, but then when you see the timing analyzer, it is showing in red because we didn't apply any timing constraint to the design. How do we know that? You can see that design is not fully constrained for setup requirements. Design is not fully constrained for old requirements. That means we didn't apply any constraint for setup. And we didn't apply any constraint for old. So there is no constraint applied for the setup requirements. And there is no constraint applied for the old requirements that is showing. So then how do we apply those setup uh, constraints and then hold? Okay, let us explore that right now. Now you can also see that it shows that timing requirements not met. 
that means we didn't apply any specific requirement for the design. And the design is not able to perform the setup analysis and hold analysis, and it is not providing you whether the number, the slack number, it is like uh, zero or it is positive or negative, whether it is met or not. Okay. How do we apply the timing constraints? So, what was the discussion yesterday is to apply the pin constraints and generate the SRAM object file and implement the design onto the board. But uh, the today's focus would be we have synthesized the design and implemented, but then we didn't apply any timing constraints. We need to apply timing constraints for the design and check whether that is meeting or not, whether there is any violation. That's what we need to do. So how do we proceed when you say, now we should click the tools. But what are the things which you need to note down? Click, click expand the timing analyzer and check all these values. And then you can see in the console, it shows timing requirements not met. That means what is the meaning is, the design is not fully constrained for setup requirements and the design is not fully constrained for the whole requirements. We didn't apply any requirements for setup and hold. How do we apply requirements for setup and hold? That we will find out right now. Now go to tools and then you can see there is a timing analyzer here. What was the discussion yesterday was to tools, run simulation tool, RTL simulation. This is what we did yesterday. When we need to configure the test bench and perform the RTL simulation, we did this process yesterday. Now what we are going to do today is go to tools and then you click timing analyzer. Then you can expand it and open the timing analyzer. Okay, once you open the timing analyzer, we have to do the first step, which is called creating the timing network. Double click and open. Now what we have done? We open the timing analyzer and then we just provided create a timing network. Now I need to show you some important things before we start applying the timing constraints. What are the things that need to be kept in mind? There is a tab called constraint here. If you click that, you can see there are multiple constraints which we can apply. Create a clock, create a generated clock, set the clock latency, set the clock uncertainty, set the clock groups. Set input delay, output delay, set pulse path, multi cycle path, max delay, bend delay, all those things you could see. There are multiple constraints which could be applied. Now, the next tab, what we also need to see is after applying the constraints, I wanted to see the reports. You can see that reports, Slack, data sheet, device specific reports, diagnostic reports, custom reports. So, there's so many reports you can see. Since we have not applied any constraints, there is no point in seeing that, right? They are inactive right now. So we should apply the constraints and then we can see whatever reports we want. Along with that, when you click constraints tab, it also shows you right STC file. That means so once you applied all the timing constraints, you wanted to write those constraints in a synopsis design constraints file, we can do that also. Okay. Let us do the first step here. So we have a simple counter design. We synthesized and implemented that. And then we have opened the Intel Quartus Prime timing analyzer with us. Now let us start applying the timing constraint. What is given in the slide? Create a clock. So let us just assume and find out whether the design works at 100 megahertz or not. That means we are going to create a clock for 10 nanoseconds. So just click here constraint and say create the clock. So click here constraints and then create the clock. When we say constraints, we can see that create the clock. What is the name of the clock? So this is very important for us to identify. So name of the clock can be anything. But uh, when you are giving to the target, like what is the name of the clock which you provided in your RTL, okay, that we need to provide. Okay, now what is the advantage of DUI that you can appreciate and understand here? For example, I say clock here. What is the name of the clock I have given? CLOCK. 
what is the period? You can see I have provided here 10 nanoseconds. Right. Now you could see the moment we provide the data here, you can see the STC command popping up here. So create underscore clock. What is the syntax? Is create clock, hyphen name, name of the clock, hyphen period, period of the clock. That's the syntax. So create clock, hyphen name, name of the clock, hyphen period, period of the clock. This is what when you say we need to attach to the RTL clock, which you have provided in your RTL. So how do you how the compiler knows that this is the port that need to be connected in your RTL? So that need to be provided. So it's called as targets. Here, if you see on the targets, on the right hand side, you can see there are three dots, right? So just click that. And then it will open a dialog box where we need to find all the ports. So if you wanted to filter it specifically, then you can approach the wild cards here. Or means it can match right all right there. But uh, since we have minimum number of ports in your port, you can directly say list here. So that I wanted to find only the clock. All other things I'm not going to bother at this junction. Just to say list, it will list everything. But now what we want is only the clock. So just click only the clock from here. And then you can see the greater than symbol here. This helps you to bring that right hand side just click here but it will come here and then you can say okay so now the command is complete create underscore clock hyphen name name of the clock hyphen period period of the clock then you can say get underscore port and then clock so create clock if a name, name of the clock, hyphen period, period of the clock, and then you can say get ports clock. So the entire command is ready right now. So what we are supposed to do when you say we can click here. Again. The moment you click run, you could see the command is available in the console, in the tickle console. So create underscore clock, hyphen name, name of the clock, hyphen period, period of the clock, and then say get ports clock. How do we know that this constraint is taken by the tool? And we can check the analysis of setup and port. What is the logic? How do we find out? What is the next step? Right? That's what we are going to understand. After applying the constraint, the clock constraint, we are expecting that the design is working at 100 megahertz or not. We have to check commands. One is we wanted to report the clock because whichever clock you have generated, you created, whether that clock is reporting correctly or not, we have to find out. One is called a report clock. And the other one is called report timing, where we have to check whether the design is free from setup and hold violations. The design is not having any setup or hold violations. We have to find out. For that, we should know the formula like required time arrival time so that will help you to get into the next step okay where we can find those report clocks we can just go here down you can see under the diagnostic tab you can see report clocks so just double click that when you say report clock it shows that okay clock and the period is 10 nanosecond, and then you can see the frequency is 100 nanosecond, which we created. What is the target? How do you know that is created by us? You can see who is the target, okay. which we provided that from your from our RTL. Okay, what is the first step? Open the timing analyzer, and then you create a timing netlist to start the process. Go to the constraints tab, and take the first command to create a clock. And we have provided all the details in the create clock tab and then just run. Then you can see that in the console that the entire command is ready. Now we have to check whether the clock is reported properly. 
what is the next command we should see is called as report timing as explained in the slide. Let's go here. Report timing, just click that. When we click that report timing, it will ask for two analysis, whether you wanted to do it for setup or whether you wanted to do it for hold. First, we will do it for setup. Then we will do it for hold. For the same design, for the same uh, logic, we can check it. But then you can also see there are two more terms there. One is the recovery, other one is removal. These two are for asynchronous parts. And these two is for synchronous, okay? Now, first you click setup, then you can go down and see report timing. Okay, so this you just click. Okay, so the moment you click it, you could see there is a data arrival path, and then it also shows you data required, data arrival path. And data required path, both it is showing. When you have a look at this data arrival path and then the data required path here. Now, what is the path summary that we have to identify? And then it is easy for us to analyze each and every portion that is shown in the waveform as well as in the statistics report. Let's click the path summary here. When we click path summary, you can see launch clock is also clock only. Latch clock is also clock only. That means there is only one clock in the design. Okay, after the break, we will try one design where you can think of having multiple clocks like that. So where you can have more than one. Now in this case, we have only one clock. There is one launch clock and then there is a latch. What is the formula we discussed uh, when we were going through the timing analysis conceptual slides? The setup analysis when we are doing it is required time minus arrival time. It is RT minus A. So if you see here the required time minus arrival time. So it is a positive number. So from where we got this number 13.581 and 4.72820, you can click this statistic. And then this will show you what are the other secret delays, like this the interconnect delay, net delay, cell delay, which is your logic delay. Everything you can see. What is the total delay? Okay. And what is the percentage here? This is the interconnect delay and this is the logic delay. Net delay, logic delay. 63 plus 67 plus 33 is 100 like that. What is the percentage you can see? This is on the clock and this is on the data. Now, if you go through all these things, you can find out that how the tool forms timing analysis. And then you click the data path here. This is the data arrival path. This is the data required part. In the required part, if you say what is the constraint we apply this at 10 nanoseconds. Along with that, what are the extra things that are added? You can see along with this 10. You are getting 3.568. That is the delay which is introduced in the clock part. What are those things you can see that in detail? Okay. Now when you get 10.568. And then this is on the required side. And on the arrival side, if you see the data arrival path there, it is only 3.641. That is the maximum delay which you can get. How do we get the path when you say you can see here? The Q1, Q2, this is from to which is the longest path when you say here, this is the longest path. One to two, and then it shows that uh, the clock skew, and then the data delay you could be able to see that. So what is the slack when you say it is 8.853? Okay. This is for that particular part. Now, if you go back and you can see, for example, report underscore timing, then you can see number of report number of paths one is there. You can see, for example, I want four. 
So you can see that, okay, there are four parts. Now, when you see that, which is the part, you can see that the 8.853, then the 8.854, then the 8.866, then 9.119 is. You could see that, okay, what is the relationship and what is the clock scheme, everything you can see that. And then what is the slack also? Okay, between Q0 to Q1, Q2 to Q3, Q1 to Q3, then Q2, Q1 to Q2, you can see that which is the launch and capture and all relationships are plotted. Okay, let us explore the whole analysis here because in the setup summary, it is showing required time minus arrival time. It is RT minus AT. Now, what we need to do is like we should also check the hold analysis. So, when we do the hold analysis here, report timing, when you double click, instead of selecting the set analysis, we select the hold analysis, just to select the hold and then say report time. Now, when we do the hold analysis, you could see the slack is 0.340, right? Now, this is the slack. Now, when we expand the path summary here, you could see it is arrival time minus required time. It is EAT minus RT. So 4.096 minus 3.756. So it shows that 0 0.340. And you can see down, it shows that the found four set of parts and then it shows zero violated. And it also shows that four, found four hold parts, zero violated, and what is the worst slack it shows. And we can see that, okay, what kind of analysis that need to be done. Now, we have not applied all the timing constraints, but then at least the major constraint, which is a clock constraint that we have applied right now. You can see which is the launch and which is the capture. And you could see that what is the data arrival you can see and what is the data required. Everything we can see in the view. So the path summary, statistics, data path, view form you could see. How it is approaching the whole slack, that information we can see. Okay, what is the next important information which we can go through is when you say, if you select any of these path, for example, you select this path, and say that, okay, you can locate this path. You can, you want to locate this path in the tree planner, or you wanted to locate that in the technology map viewer, wherever you want. So for example, if you wanted to locate that in the chip planner, so you can see that, okay, inside the chip planner, where is that path you can find? So you can see there is a blue dot. This is that path. This is your chip, max 10 device, and this is your flash memory. Okay? And the path is here. You can directly see that you can locate that path in the chip plan. Or else you wanted to locate that path in the technology map viewer. That means I wanted to go back to the schematic. You can go back. This is the path which the compiler is explaining. So this starts from the register, goes through the combo logic, and ends at the register line. You can see that. What is the logic it provides? Now, these information we can get from the timing engine. Okay, what is another important thing which we can also go through? It's like when you apply the constraints here, right? When you click the constraints tab, it also shows you that write STC file. When you say write STC file, it is uh, saving the constraint which you have applied in a dot SDC extension file. You can just say OK here, and then we can go back to the drive, right? Inside the C drive, I have a folder called Timing Analysis. Inside that, you could see counter out dot STC file. So when you open this STC file, for example, if I wanted to open that in whatever, you can see that. Create clock, hyphen name, name of the clock, hyphen period, you can see 10 nanoseconds, and hyphen waveform shows that where it is rise and where it is fall. The entire information is provided. 
but uh, which device we have targeted that information you want that you can see it here. What is the device? Okay, and which version we are using that also will have here. Whether you are doing which version, you can see it is a light edition. And when did we generate? All this information should be available in the SDC file. That is very, very important for us to understand that okay, the SDC file is already there for it. So what is the advantage when you say we can see that what constraints are applied for this design earlier and what constraints can be added later. So that is very helpful for you because uh, whether the design is having all the constraints which are required or not, that we can definitely analyze from. Okay, now we have seen that what could be analyzed inside the design and uh, we can also see how to write the STC file if you want. If you don't want to write the STC file, it is optional. Okay. Now let us again go back to the slide. And, uh, we will refer to more important things and come back again. So to see the create clock command, what we discussed is, see here, create underscore clock, hyphen name, name of the clock, hyphen period, period of clock, and we will say get underscore ports clock. Now, if you see, what is the difference when you say if you don't have 50 percentage duty cycle, then we need to use this iPhone waveform option because that is very, very important for us to understand that which is the rise and which is the fall. So you could see here, create underscore clock, iPhone period, that is 10 nanosecond. But iPhone waveform, if you see, it raises at two, right, and then you can see that it falls at eight. So this is not having 50% duty cycle because again, it raises at two. From two to two, it is taking 10 nanoseconds. But that is not the case with the earlier one. Here you can see that it is like, uh, so because you could see 20 nanoseconds, that means that it is like zero, then it falls at 10 and again raises at two. So this is the way you need to create the two. So if it is like even waveform shows like 0, 05 for us, that means what it is ensuring that it is having a 50% duty set. If that is not the case, then we have to definitely look into our waveform because there may be a difference in the clock index. Now you will be familiar with this uh, uh, dialog box right now because I have showed the demo first to you. And then I'm showing you the slide right now. So whenever we open the create clock command, so using the GUI, you have to say create clock, and then we have to insert constraint, and then we should say create clock. When you do that, you could see that you want to provide rising and falling. Also, that could be possible. So we didn't do that because we wanted that to be having 50% duty cycle. If that is not the case, yes, you can provide this number also. Create clock iPhone name, name of the clock, iPhone period, and shows T nanosecond, waveform, T, then 8, and then you can say get ports clock. All right. Now, what is very, very important for us when you say when we have constrained the design completely, then you don't have any problem because uh, when you have not applied the constraints for all the parts, there are chances that your design will be unconstrained. Is there any possibility to find out the unconstrained parts in our design? And you say, yes, definitely it is possible. Even for the counter design, we can find out that we have not constrained input to reg path as well as register to output path. Because while the starting of the session, I explained you that the timing analysis divides the circuit into different number of timing paths. But if you have a look at it, we applied the timing constraints for only register to register path, reg to reg. Because it has taken register to zero to register one, register one to register two, like that. Yes, that's fine. But have we applied timing constraints for input to reg path when we say we have not applied? And we have not applied timing constraints for reg to output path. So without applying timing constraints for input to reg and for reg to output path, we cannot say that, okay, we have completed all the constraints. 
So there may be unconstrained parts in the design. Because of that, the design will have issues later. Is there any way to find out that when you say yes, it is possible? So how we can find out when you say in the same spring analysis engine, okay, you can look for unconstrained parts. We can see that report unconstrained parts. When I click report unconstrained parts, you can see it shows illegal clocks zero and unconstrained clocks zero. That means there is no problem in clock constraints. So constraining a register to register path is fine. But then what constraints have not been applied when you say unconstrained input ports and unconstrained input port path? So you can see that the input port, the input ledge path is not constrained. And then there are four output port paths. One is Q of zero, Q of one, Q of two, and Q of three. There are four output port paths, and they are also not constrained. So you have to ensure that everything should be zero before we save the constraints into an SDC file and continue the fitter operation. Otherwise, what will happen when you say the design is not properly constrained? So when the design is not fully constrained or not properly constrained, or it is under constraint, definitely you now issue something end because we have applied only constraint for the register to register path. You can see the design is not fully constrained for the top requirement, and design is not fully constrained for the whole requirement issues because there are unconstrained paths in the design that you could be able to see that in the tool for the same design, even though. We have constrained only for this parts. You could see that the other parts need to be constrained in order to achieve the timing closure effectively. Right. So how the tool approaches it that we will see later. We'll explain to you. But what is the basic scenario here? It's like okay, you have to ensure that all the parts need to be constrained. That is very, very important for us to do the process right now. Okay, how do we achieve that? That part is very important for us to understand. Okay. Now, first thing is like we have to see report clocks that we have seen that. And uh, we also need to know how to apply the constraints for the input to reach path as well as the register to output path. Right now, let us see that. Now, in an FPGA design, you could see that uh, you have an FPGA, like if you go through the schematic. What you could see is like when we directly enter into the tool and go to the netlist viewers and then open the RTL viewer. Right, so this may not give you the complete detail. Let us open the technology map. Here, there is an input to reg path. Okay. And then there is also a register to output path so because the clock is here. Then it goes through the normal logic and ends at output. What we have constrained so far is only register to register. What we need to constrain is input to reg and then reg to output. But what information we don't have when you say it? This is the FPGA device. There would be a device before the FPGA and there would be a device which is after the FPGA, like that you understand. That means somebody is going to launch the data and FPGA is going to capture the data. And in this case, the FPGA is going to launch the data and some external device is going to capture the data. Now, without knowing those details, it is very constrained input to reg path as well as register output path. Why it is very because they are not proper static timing analysis paths because in one side, who is launching, we don't know. In other side, who is latching, receiving, that we don't know. In one place, the source flip-flop is unknown. In another place, we don't know who is the destination. But then without applying those constraints, we cannot completely constrain the entire uh, ST design, right? We cannot uh, ensure that okay, these things are done. So we have to ensure that IO constraints need to be applied. Assuming that there is a memory, then what information can be taken from the data sheet to constrain the design better? So let us understand that right now. 
if you go through this here, right? What is important here? It's like there is a memory. It is available before and after the FPGA. Let us explore that right now. Then you can see that there is a clock, which is the clock access. Now we can see that this is the 2.3 nanoseconds. What is the time taken? That we can note down. What is the take clock to that delay? We can understand. Okay, so this is the time taken from the external device. How long it will take to reach the FPG that we can note. So this information can be taken from the data sheet. Okay, I have the data sheet of the device, which would be interacted between FPG like. Who is the launch and who is the capture? I know when you say. And you have the details with you, then we can definitely constrain input to register path as well as register to output path. How do we explore that right now when you say this is the way it has to be done? Assume there is a memory before the FPGA, and then there is a memory which is after the FPGA. Now what is this when you say this is called as set input delay? What is the set input delay when you say that is the parameters need to be taken? One is the clock of the external device, and then the maximum test delay that it reaches the FPG. So we call this as a set input delay. Set input delay is having two parameters. What is that when you say one is the T clock? Of the external device. At the maximum test delay till the greatest step. Okay, this information from where we can get it? We can get this from the data sheet. We will have both minimum value as well as maximum value. So this is on the left hand side. Okay. Right. How do we note down that when you say you can see that formula here? The set input delay minimum is equal to minimum of external chip. Minimum board delay that we have to take. Maximum delay means what? Maximum clock to output. This is T clock to Q. Let's call it clock to output of the external chip. That's maximum board delay. Right? So these informations, if we know, then we can constrain the input to register path. Okay, this is on the one side, like input to reg path. Can we do the same on the other side, which is called as register to output path when you say, yes, that is also definitely possible. On the other side, if you see, which is called as the output delay, which is from the register to the output path. It starts from the register and then it goes to the output, which is your memory. What we should understand is, we, we are not aware of the setup time. So, Maximum setup time of the external chip, maximum board delay. This information somebody should provide to us. Okay, they should also provide the hold time and then the minimum board delay because the data should be available before the setup. Now, for us, we have to ensure that the data should be available right, for some time so that uh, the external data should, the external device should capture the data faster. That is very, very important for us. Because if the external device is not capturing the data faster, then we will lose the data. Now, what happens is you could see this becomes a register to register path. And this becomes a register to register. Now, what we have understood everything in timing analysis is a register to register path. So now everything will be a register. There will be a launch flip flop, there will be a capture flip flop. So now what we need to do is in order to constrain input to reg and reg to output paths, we should provide set input delay and set output delay, and we have to calculate that from the data sheet which is provided. Okay, now can we just give some assumptions and then provide some constraints? We can, right? But uh, what is very critical here is like the numbers, whatever we have provided is not exactly matching what is there in the data sheet. Later. Your design will not matter. Sir, I could hear some disturbance. Is it some question, sir? All right, sir. Thank you. Now, have we applied all the constraints when we say yes, we have not applied it? 
Now, how do we apply right now? Let us see that. How do we solve this problem? And we say, let us explore with uh, different numbers and see that whether the tool is able to approach those values. So, at this junction, I am just assuming and providing you some numbers. That is not the exact case which is available in the data sheet because we don't know that whom we are going to interface this counter with. But then, can we try with some values, like we say, to ensure that all the uh, paths are constrained? Yes, we can try that. Okay, so how this demo helps you? This demo helps you to understand the syntax of set input delay rather than what values we need to feed in. Okay, so go to constraint. Okay, and then go to set input delay. Click that set input delay. In this tab, give the name of the clock, skew clock, and then you should provide the delay value. You provide the delay value maximum number you provide. Okay, and in the target, you say all inputs, all the inputs I wanted to have some delay. same delay. Yes, you then you can see that I have given the clock name. And then I have given maximum two nanosecond. And then I have provided this now. So when you run here, you could see the command here set input delay hyphen clock name of the clock maximum two nanoseconds. Now can we apply minimum? Yes, you can. So directly again go back to the set input delay and say clock instead of maximum now click minimum. Give, give delay value as one nanosecond and then target as all underscore input and uh, say run. Now we what we have given maximum is two nanoseconds, worst case, and minimum is one. Nanosecond. Okay, can I apply register the output path which is set output delay when you say yes, we can. So, what we could do here, go back to the constraints once again, go set output delay. And then say clock, say maximum, say one nanosecond, say all underscore output. All outputs are having the same data, something like that. Right? Now run. Again, go back to the constraints and then go back to the set output delay, clock, and say minimum, and say delay value of, for example, 0.5 nanoseconds, and say instead of uh, maximum, select minimum, and say all underscore outputs. All outputs are having the same. So just say run. What we have provided now? Maximum two, minimum one, Set output delay maximum one, and minimum five, five, something like that we provide. Can we see the report unconstrained paths right now? Yes, we can see. See here? All the paths are constrained, it's just zero. Now what we have understood right now is like without, uh, Applying the timing constraint, that means without applying the proper timing constraints for the design, there is no point in proceeding further because we will have issues at the end of the day. So it is our responsibility to ensure that all the paths are constrained before we save the constraints and then continue with the filter operation. Right? So this is what is shown in the slide. You could see that the moment you apply all the timing constraint, uh, then you could see that it should show zero. This is what is provided here. Right. Now, what is another important thing which we need to do before the break when we say there are three important parts which we have seen. One is called as constraining input to reach, constraining register to register, and constraining register to output path. But then Yesterday, we developed a real loud code, a logic gate or an AND gate. That code does not have any register. So that means there is no input to reg path, there is no register to register path, and there is no register to output path. It is a purely combinatorial path. You can see that this, it starts from the input, goes through the combo logic, the ends at the output. If that is the case, how are we going to constrain the design? That is the next question we will have. It is very easy to constrain input to reg, reg to reg, and reg to output path by using the create clock command 
set input delay command and set output delay command. What commands need to be applied? If we have a design which is purely combinatorial. Okay, right. Solve this problem. What we can do is let us open yesterday's design. Okay, I'm just saving the file. How do we do that when you say we can open the yesterday's file? Okay, so I am not very sure that where it is available when you say yes, we can search it. Go to open project and then we can go to the C drive. And then what we tried yesterday, so we can see logic gate design. You can recollect that inside that you will have a QPF file, which is the Quartus project file. Okay, and say open. Okay, so to ensure is it correct or not, you can go to the files logic and check whether. See, this is an add gate example, and this is the add gate. Okay, this is what we tried yesterday. Okay, what is the problem when you say there is no input to reg, there is no reg to reg, there is no reg to output? It is a purely combinatorial. Problem. Then how are we going to constrain this? That's what is the understanding. So in order to constrain a purely combinational path, we have to apply set max delay and set min delay. This is what we should apply. So that means we are going to what is say what is the maximum delay and what is the minimum delay. So that the compiler will try to take it based on the arrival time, whether it is meeting or not. How do we check it? Let us try this with this example. The same design what we did yesterday, just go through that and perform compilation. If you don't have, then you can uh, develop a simple AND gate or any simple combo logic like decoder or encoder, and then we can try that by itself. So I'm taking a simple design so that it's easy for you to recollect and then uh, try on your own. Okay. Now uh, you can recollect the yesterday's discussion also. Like we have done everything yesterday, and then we implemented the design onto the board. But what we have not done was timing analysis. Now you can see there is a timing analyzer tab because it's showing red. That means we didn't apply any timing constraints to the device. How do we apply right now? Now we can go to the tools and then go to the timing analyzer. And say create timing network. Okay. As of now, there is no clock in the design because it's a pure combo logic. So, for example, if say report clocks, if you ask, it shows that no clocks to report because it's a pure combo logic. Then, how do we apply timing constraints for this design? When you say to solve this problem, we have set max delay and set min delay that need to be applied for the pure combinational logic design. Okay, we will apply that and see what happens inside the design. So go to the constraints, and here you can see there is a set max delay you can see that set the maximum delay and the set minimum delay these two need to be applied for a pure combo logic first you click set maximum delay here uh, from where when you say all inputs because it starts from the input where it will end output input to output because there is no flip-flop so what you should write here from all underscore inputs and to say to all underscore outputs from all inputs to all outputs. That's all you should write. From all inputs to all outputs, what is the delay? For example, I give eight nanoseconds. I'm not very sure whether it will work or not, but we'll try. Right? So we will give all underscore inputs and all underscore outputs and say delay value eight nanoseconds and say run. Now we can see the command now. Set max delay. Python from all inputs to all outputs and say eight nanoseconds. Now can we try set minimum delay? Yes, we can. So just click here set minimum delay and say all underscore inputs and say all underscore outputs. So inputs to outputs and say delay value. For example, I say two nanoseconds. 
I have provided these two commands. Maximum is eight, minimum is two. I have. Can we see the timing now? Report timing here and save setup, which is uh, your required time minus arrival time. That means you can see that required is eight. That's what we provided. Table was 7.9. What is it? 7.9? It takes 7.9. Nine two nanoseconds to reach from B to Y. There are only two paths. One is A to Y, the other one is B to Y. Which is the longest path here? B to Y. B is the input, Y is the output. From B to reach Y, it takes 7.92 nanoseconds. If you go through the statistics, we can understand it. From where we get this 7.2. You can go through, add all this interconnect and cell. You will come to know from where we get this number. And then we can see there is one more path which is from A to Y. But A to Y is only 7.729. Which is the critical path here when you say B to Y is a critical path? If this path is meeting timing, then we don't need to worry about the rest of the path because that will also meet time. So the critical path is this. And this is meeting timing because we have a slack of positive number. Now again, we can check for hold here. It means so the minimum value. Let's click here, hold. And say report time. Now this is arrival time minus required time. This AT minus RT. You can see the slack is positive. So in both cases, you could see the number is positive. Therefore, the design is meeting time. So what we have understood in these uh, demonstrations and then the logic is you can constrain the pure combo logic block also. You can also constrain the design which is having the sequential logic which clocks so to apply there are four important commands we have understood one is create a clock the other one is set input delay for constraining input to edge path set output delay for constraining register to output paths and then set max delay and set min delay for constraining pure combinational logic paths so if you go through this in the logic, you will come to know. Like you can see set max delay and set minimum delay when you apply, you can provide them separately. So you can provide maximum delay, maximum values, and a minimum delay you can provide them. From any input to any output, we can provide them. If you wanted to start from input one and then you should go to input two, or you can say input one to any output, that is also possible. Because there are two outputs. For any output, you are providing the number. This is the condition. Right. So, uh, to summarize what we have seen so far is to apply timing constraints for a design in which the launch and the capture clock are one and the same. And then how to constrain pure combinational logic clocks. Are there any questions? Uh, please let me know. Right now, there are no questions, sir. Thanks, sir. Then uh, we'll take a break uh, for 15 minutes, like 11.45, we can start. Yes, 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 sir. Uh, so, sure, sir. so thank you very much. Uh, thank you all uh, for patiently uh, listening to. And it was a very nice lecture, sir. Very well explained uh, with thank all you. details. Uh, where it wanted to be slow, it was slow. Uh, and when uh, when it was wanted to be fast, it was fast. So right pace for most of the participants, I suppose. So what I am doing as yesterday, uh, I am stopping the recording as well as uh, exiting the meeting so that the uh, uh, video stays in cloud, generates in cloud, and I am starting meeting again. So please rejoin. Uh, sir, there is one... Uh, Query from one of the participants. Can you provide yeah, sure. today's as well as yesterday's slides? Definitely, sir. I, I have converted them into PDF, but today I will share both materials. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, so sir. I'm stopping the recording. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll meet again after 15 minutes. Sure, sir.